Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Uh, it's a real pleasure of mine to introduce you tonight to Ted Siakopoulos. He's a professional economist and sought-after speaker with over 25 years of experience analyzing real estate and financial markets. Over his professional career, his commentary and research has been uh, widely quoted across major media outlets such as Money Magazine, BNN, CTV, and CBC, and now the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. <laughs> Under his guidance, a team of uh, Canadian mortgage and housing corporation real estate analysts, economists, ranked first in forecast accuracy in 2015 against a consensus group of external economic and housing forecasters. In June 2020, he co-authored a book titled Property Trendsetters, highlighting how Gen Z needs to prepare for the economic and real estate disruptions that are coming. The book hit bestseller in uh, both uh, categories in both US and Canada. Tonight, his uh, commentary uh, are his own, um, his comments are his own and do not reflect those of his organization where he is, as I mentioned, the senior economist of the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. We're going to talk a little bit about the housing market. We're going to talk about financial markets and we're going to talk about uh, his uh, book, Property Trendsetters, highlighting how Gen Z needs to prepare for the real estate disruptions that are going to come. Ted, thank you for joining us. How are you? I'm great. Thank you uh, for the invite. So, how are economic and real estate disruptions going to affect uh, Gen Z people? So, you know, we have um, in the book that I co-authored, we, we talked a little bit about the three big disruptions. Uh, um, and we call it the 3D disruption that's coming. Uh, in fact, that's already here. So uh, the digital economy uh, is one example. Um, you know, uh, uh, the second example is, is rising household debt. And, and the third example is aging demographics. So all of these three uh, disruptions um, mean something very specific for the next generation. Uh, and I can expand on this, uh, Brian, if you'd like. Please. Uh, yeah. So the digital economy disruption uh, is really the fourth industrial revolution right, that we're in right now. Uh, and this follows the steam engine, uh, the, um, you know, the uh, a mass production assembly line, and of course the computer chip uh, in the 70s and 80s. So this is the fourth in line, uh, uh, you know, following three other industrial revolutions. What's interesting here, uh, Brian, is they all had similar characteristics. They all pushed supply up, uh, they disrupted labor markets, uh, they pushed inflation and interest rates lower, and they contributed to rising household debt. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, the digital revolution, what is it? Well, it's, it's everything from moving from analog to digital signals to, um, you know, ma massive speeds in data dissemination uh, to, you know, artificial intelligence, big data, robotics, um, you know, there are estimates out there right now that the uh, digital revolution in the next decade, which is set to accelerate, could displace up to 40 to 50 percent of, of jobs out there. So, um, it, you know, that's that's why it's a disruption and, and that could really hamper the plans of next generation in terms of, you know, their, their ability to buy and rent a home. So how, uh, how's second, that going to impact them? Because, like, how's that going to impact their ability to buy and rent a home? So, um you know, with with forty to fifty percent of the jobs, uh, current jobs, um, being at risk, um, uh, you know, th they really need to possess skills that will remain resilient in the face of of digital change. So, um, you know, in in some cases, uh, those in task oriented routine type jobs uh, lower paying to you know lower paying jobs like uh, administrative like transportation there's some truck drivers out there who are who are who are really going to be impacted uh, jobs in financial services that are more routine oriented um, uh, clerical uh, you know these are these are these are jobs that are at risk and and if uh, if, if you don't adapt skills that will remain resilient, skills like being a critical thinker, skills like emotional, social intelligence, uh, uh, problem solver, um, uh, you know, uh, jobs in the consultancy side of the economy. Um, these are jobs that are going to be more resilient. And so clearly uh, disruptions to income flow from displacement and 
and that's the obvious way that um, that uh, that people are impacted, right? Uh, it's a disruption to income and their inability to uh, service debt, service a mortgage, or pay their rent. So this so, is going to be a big change for everybody. Um, I, I think so, and and I think what's triggering this, Brian, is that you know growth in the economy peaked in 2017 at 3%. That's what it was in Canada. It was slightly below that for Ontario. Uh, but since then, growth has slowed down. Uh, and we're running, uh, you know, obviously with the pandemic, you're getting numbers in the 5 to 6% range, but that's not the long-term steady state that you can expect. Uh, if, you, if you're listening to the Bank of Canada talk and other forecasters, you know, we're looking at a long-term potential rate of growth in and around one to one and a half percent. So basically we're talking about half the rate of growth that we've experienced, you know, in the last four to five decades. Uh, that's what we're looking at. And so businesses will have less control over top line revenue. And so how do they boost profits or maintain profits? They really need to control costs. So this is where they start investing more in, in technology in capital, um, uh, uh, enhancing productivity, enhancing uh, uh, types of investments. And, and, you know, as I say, this has the potential of displacing a number of workers. Uh, certainly there will be jobs created in the IT space. There will be jobs created in other space, uh, in other sectors, but uh, it won't be enough. And, and as I say, it, it, it does have the potential to really disrupt uh, the labor market and in turn, um, um, you know, impact people's ability to buy and rent a home. Now, there's there's something else, uh, else here uh, as well that I sort of argue in the book, uh, Brian, and that is that um, with more capital and technology, people are going to be more productive, no question right. about it. And what we may see is that five-day work week shifting back to a four-day work week. Uh, businesses will find, hey, if you can deliver results in four days, I don't need you for that That's last a big day. Change because most people are complaining that uh, they're working longer hours with COVID nineteen, and they're always online, and they're always answering their telephone, and they can't separate out home versus business. Right. Uh, that's the here and now. Um, I'm suggesting, you know, in the next five to ten years, you know, that is slowly going to shift, and we're already we already know that since the 1970s. The average work week in terms of hours worked has been drifting lower, Brian. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, it has been trending down and will continue uh, as these um, technology investments uh, accelerate through the next decade. So uh, ultimately, what it means is four-day work week, uh, prospective uh, employees, prospective home buyers, renters, they will need to juggle more than just one employer in the future to make things uh, to make things work, right? Uh, so, you know, the gig economy that we hear a lot about, well, that's not dead. In fact, anything, that's just going to accelerate. And we're going to see that sort of gig economy uh, broaden out to other sectors. So, you know, basically what it says is, is more uh, households needing to juggle more jobs, more than one employer, and more uncertainty. So uh, ultimately, uh, that, 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 that's, that's, a, that's a challenge. And, you know, we, and, and there's strategies to overcome that. So that, that, that's primarily the digital economy and some of the risks. Um, I also talk about household debt. Right. And we've got a, we've got a bit of a problem uh, a here and now. At, uh, an all-time high, are we not? Yeah, so we are at an all-time high. And um, moving forward, if incomes are only growing at the half, half the rate they were growing in the past, and the cost of living continues to, to move up, um, uh, with interest rates staying low, uh, debt could potentially continue to, to grow. And, um, and so, so, you know, this is uh, something else that could potentially restrain uh, a prospective uh, person in Gen Z or Gen Y uh, from jumping into home ownership or being able to access home ownership or even for that matter, uh, able to rent because of the, the, the load, uh, the debt load that they're carrying. And then that, that will likely continue to grow given what we know about previous industrial revolutions and what played out there. Um, so, 
So that's the second D in the three D. Uh, the other about, one isn't. Tell me yeah, about go. you know our household debt um, versus uh, the U.S. Have aren't we sort of you know above where the U.S. was when they had their big financial collapse? Absolutely, that's a great point. We are we are we are seeing household debt to income ratios here in Canada uh, eclipse what we saw in the United States. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, the fact is is that households currently who own a home um, uh, are consuming more housing here in Canada than what we're seeing elsewhere around the world. Um, so you know we this picture bigger, more housing. So we've got we got bigger homes. Or we own homes we've more got, or what? So uh, we've got, you know, the ownership rate is obviously higher here in Canada. And um, we are, um, you know, in terms of, is, is, you know, the amount of housing that we need versus how much we're actually using, um, uh, you know, there is there is more space out there that's being consumed uh, in some cases than what is what is needed. Uh, in other cases, it's the reverse. But we're we're definitely c consuming more housing today than uh, than history uh, suggests. And um, you know, there's a larger a larger share of the economy today relies on housing, uh, residential construction as a share of the economy is in and around eight to ten percent. That's double where it was, uh, you know, a decade ago. So what's going uh, so, to happen with this uh, massive amount of household debt? So, you know, ultimately, um, we, we really need to um, build strategies to manage it. And, and in the book, I, I talk a little bit about some of the strategies. So, for instance, um, Canada, in terms of financial literacy, you know, we're ranked quite highly. Uh, our literacy rates aren't too bad uh, compared to other countries around the world. There is one pocket of concern, however, uh, and that is that uh, few, fewer Canadians understand how comp compound interest works. That's, that's a concern for me. Secondly, um, fewer Canadians understand the difference between a, a, the amortization on a mortgage and the term of a mortgage. Um, but more importantly, um, the share of Canadians who have a budget uh, is not where it needs to be. Uh, we're looking at a, only half the population that has reported to uh, have a budget. And so really at the end of the day, if you wanna manage debt, you really need to start early in life. Uh, getting into financial habits early in life is critical. And that means building a plan. And the, and the empirical data is clear, uh, crystal clear, Brian. Here's what it says. 90% of those who have a budget stay within budget and they engage less in impulsive buying. Uh, they see their income as a constraint. So they are willing to make trade-offs. Those, uh, those who have a budget, those who don't have a budget are more likely to you know, uh, live beyond their means, engage in impulsive buying, take on more debt. Uh, so the... The, the key here is, is getting, the, getting into, sorry, go ahead. Have a budget. Have a budget, but it all begins at a young age. And the sweet spot, uh, Brian, isn't what financial planners suggest mid-20s, early 20s. It starts at the age of 15. Why the age of 15? That's when, on average, Canadians um, land their first job. They generate their first level of income. They need to manage that income. And that means uh, managing not, not just what percentage am I going to spend, but what percentage am I going to save? It starts at the age of 15. Why? As they say, uh, income starts flowing. But also, uh, you want to get ahead of the curve because we know that a few years later, credit cards come into the picture, a student loan comes into the picture, a car loan comes into the picture. So you want to be in a position where you are engaging in, in good be financial behaviors, right? Early. Uh, so I, I think that's that's that, that's something that's very critical, and you know I always point to the <laughs> the Vancouver and Toronto housing experience between 2015 and 2017. Now, if you recall, Brian, markets were overheating, prices were rising rapidly in both Vancouver and Toronto. People were in this FOMO mindset: if I, I the fear of missing out, if I don't yeah. buy now, I'm going to be shut out. Hasn't that only uh, increased? That has stayed with us for sure in the present day, 
But what I recall in that experience is that um, 50% of those who bought paid above budget. And I suspect that those who paid above budget really didn't have a budget. Um, and, and so uh, when you don't have a budget um, and you're in these sort of bidding wars and you don't have a plan, you become financially uh, sorry, emotionally hijacked. And, and, and bad things happen when you become emotionally hijacked. You take on, uh, uh, you, you, you pay a higher price than what you, 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 you could afford. You take on more debt and things just unravel, right? So, you know, these are strategies that one could put in place to really manage the, the, the risks of higher debt moving forward. But put a plan together, put a budget together and stick, stick with the budget. You know, be disciplined enough to stick with it. Um, and, you know, uh, the last the last D is an age, an aging, an aging population. And, and here's what an aging population means for those prospective buyers, younger buyers that will be looking at buying or renting a home in the next decade. We know we know one thing. The population is going to age. That's a guarantee almost as much as taxation. Right. We know that by 2030. Um, 25% of Toronto's population will be over the age of 65. That's a quarter of the entire population. We also know that as households age, they age, they, they like to age in their communities. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of the, the, these households, um, you know, 50% of them are living in single detached housing. So that's a lot of housing locked up over the next 10 years locked up in the sense that in many ways it won't be available for younger households that are following. Um, so what do we need to do? Well, we need to rezone some of these uh, yellow belt communities, yellow belt meaning single family communities that don't allow density. Um, why do we need to do that? We need to do that because it does two things. It allows older households who are aging to remain in their communities and transition to other types of housing, uh, which in many cases is more maintenance free. Uh, it also frees up a lot of that single family housing for buyers that are waiting in the wings, right? Mm -hmm. So it frees up supply. That's a good thing. Um, but, you know, that's, that's a strategy that we need to embrace. However, we're, we're facing a lot of nimbyism, right? Uh, and, and what I find ir ironic about NIMBYism, Brian, is that those who are on the front lines of NIMBYism are the ones who are also uh, arguing, we need to make housing more affordable for our children. <laughs> but more affordable, but not near me. Precisely, yes. But more affordable, but not, near, not in my backyard, not near me. And, uh, and here's the other thing. Um, I'm not sure... Uh, you know, more mature households are really engaging in, in forward thinking here because if they really want to age in place in their communities, they may be shooting themselves in the, in the foot because they're restricting options for themselves. They're pricing themselves uh, out of their own market. Yeah, precisely. So, so that's, that's, the, the, that's some of the, the challenges from an aging demographic. The other big challenge, Brian, is that... Um, we're, we're, we've got a shortage of trades, building trades out there. Um, and the building community, uh, developers, builders, they haven't embraced technology. They're building homes the way they used to, they, they, they were building homes in the, you know, 50 years ago. Right. So um, if, if the population is aging and we've got a shortage of building trades today and that's only set to accelerate, that's going to add to construction costs. That's going to add to the price of housing. It's going to make housing less affordable. So, so Ted, so, I spoke with the, pre the president of BUILD, and he said that there's 4.5 million people moving to the greater Toronto area in the next 30 years. How are we going to deal with that? Well, um, again, um, uh, first of all, we need to... Uh, we need to find ways to boost supply and we need to exactly. rezone some of the communities that uh, do not allow more density. Uh, we need to expedite the planning approval process, uh, Brian. Um, you know, it's just taking far too long for uh, projects to, uh, to get approved and to hit the market. Um, 
we need to uh, we need more missing middle housing. This isn't just um, townhomes, uh, Brian. This this is also condominiums, mid density condominiums with more square footage. You know, we've got to move out of this mindset that the only thing we the market needs is uh, you know shoebox condos, right? Uh, we know the market has been shifting away from small square footage condos. Uh, we need, you know, the need for space just didn't uh, arise with COVID. Uh, it's been in play for several years. Why? Well, my, millennials are aging and they're moving into those age categories, 30 to 35, when fertility rates are a lot higher. They're having kids, so they need more space. So we need to, we need to build different types of housing versus what we've seen in recent years. So that missing middle piece is critical. Um, but, you know, as I say, the other critical part is that builders need to start thinking about uh, embracing technology and creating more efficiencies in the production of housing. Because if they're able to do that, that's going to keep costs down. It's going to keep prices uh, growing at a, at a much more sustainable rate. And, and that contributes to affordability. Uh, so, uh, Brian, if you're aware of um, uh, the term modular housing, yep, uh, we're seeing modular housing. Um, a show um, uh, a, a fascinating show on a company that does modular housing out of containers, and they can uh, they can build their uh, their modular uh, homes um, for they think one quarter the price of a build on site. And uh, the, the savings comes from a bunch of different things. One of them is they say that the typical build on site house has between 10 and 15% waste in all of their supplies, lumber that's thrown out, concrete that's thrown out, et cetera. And they also said there's a really significant number of, of un inclement days that you can't work, that if you're building in a factory, you just don't have the problem of. So these are all great points. Um, um, and I'm not going to repeat them. <laughs> You've already highlighted them. Uh, but modular housing, to a large extent, has been really focused on modular affordable housing for lower income households. We've seen a lot of great success stories in the city of Toronto with, you know, record times uh, being able to deliver the, these modular homes and house some of the homeless uh, out there. Some, some real great stories there. I'm suggesting let's broaden the use of modular homes to market housing more generally, right? Let's get into this manufacturing mindset uh, uh, when we think about the construction of a home. Uh, and it requires uh, uh, the building community to embrace technology a bit more than they have. Uh, and, and, and so I think this is a solution. And, and we're seeing it not just here in Canada, we're seeing it in other parts of the world that panelization, a modular, uh, modular approach does make sense. Now- Ted, Ted, I apologize, yeah, I gotta go take ahead. a break. You've been sure. unbelievably, like the most knowledgeable guy you can imagine, but we've gotta take a break for some messages. Perfect. Um, you've uh, given us uh, a great description of uh, the problems, uh, the changes, and some of the solutions. I'm going to come back and ask you a little bit about mortgage rates and housing prices and what you actually think is going to happen in the short term uh, after uh, a break for some messages. Stay with us. Thank you. Welcome back. Wow. What a bunch of, what an incredible, you know, vo volume of information from Ted C. Akopoulos, the head uh, economist at the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, who's tonight here with his personal views, not his organizational views. And uh, we've talked uh, a lot about his book and the four Ds that I think are, are big uh, things that are coming. Remind us, Ted, of both those four Ds, if you could. What are they really quickly? So the, the digital uh, disruption, the digital, digital economy disruption, disruption uh, rising household debt. Debt. And aging demographics. Aging de were there only three Ds? I thought there were four. Uh, three Ds, but um, I did hint at a fourth one, which uh, we don't really need to get into. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I apologize. So no digital uh, disruption, uh, demographic changes, and debt. Uh, That's and, it. Uh, you know, I think all of us can understand that those are some big issues. Um, let me, you know, that's long term. Let me take you short term, Ted. Um, you know, housing 
market is is on fire right now. Um, some people are saying that it's in a balloon and it's going to burst. It's a bubble. It's going to burst. Other people are saying you've been saying that for ten years that it's been a bubble that it's going to burst and it's never burst. Um, and other people say yeah, it is a bubble, but it's not going to burst because interest rates are historic low. The government is going to keep it at historic lows. Our four and a half million people are coming in. Uh, immigration is going to have, be there. Interest rates are going to stay low. So don't worry about if it's a bubble. In fact, get in because you'll never be able to afford to get in if you don't get in now. What's the chief economist? Sorry, you're not talking on as a chief economist. You're talking about you're talking tonight as Ted. What does Ted say? Is it is it a bubble? Is it going to burst or is it never going to burst? So. Um... In my 25, 30 years uh, working in the housing uh, industry and in financial markets, um, I, I could never recall a time when the economy is growing, uh, markets are in balance the seller's territory, and prices collapse. Uh, so, uh, you know, we are seeing a uh, economic recovery. Uh, we're coming out of the pandemic very strongly. Uh, economic growth this year is set to to grow anywhere between, you know, uh, around 6% in Canada, slightly faster in the United States. Um, we're seeing job creation coming back. Uh, incomes are growing. Uh, housing markets are anywhere else but a buyer's market where prices are falling. They're quite tight. You know, those are conditions to me that suggest that we're not going to see uh, a, 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 a serious price correction here. So what we may see, Brian- It's bubble, but it's not gonna burst because there's no triggering event to burst it. The, precisely, there, there, there isn't a tr really a, significant set of triggers out there that would that would uh, cause a, a prices to, to correct in, 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 in a serious way. I think it's however, interest rates. interest rates going up couldn't do it. So here's the however. Um, think about what happened in the second uh, in the back half of 2017 after the foreign buyer tax came in. We have a we had a bit of a short lived reset in prices for single detached homes. And when I say a reset, it's, it didn't last. It was a couple quarters, prices leveled out, and then they started to grow again, more in line with inflation, I'd say about one, 2%, the single detached housing. We're likely going to see a very similar picture this time um, and for singles. Um, and the reason I say for singles is that's where all of the um, price acceleration has been in the past year. Uh, pandemic and remote working, the need for space pushed the prices of single detached housing up, particularly outside of core neighborhoods, outside of the GTA. We can talk about that in a moment. So do I see a bit of a very short, short lived reset? Absolutely. Um, but, you know, what do we go back to? We go back to prices maybe a year and a half ago, right? Not a big deal. Um, um, and, and, and I think that that, that is strict. It could be a sorry for the people that just bought. Um, you know, I, I, I think, I think um, I, 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 you know, I think it depends on whether you've entered the market today and what your time horizon is versus whether you are in the market and and what your uh, and what your you know how much equity you've 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 amassed, um, you know I, I think when you look out a year uh, and you just you look at, at at our forecast that was just released a couple a couple of weeks ago, what we're saying here is is that this blip could happen for a few quarters, but average annual prices, Brian are still gonna be growing single digits, not double digits. We're just talking about uh, a slowing in the growth of average annual prices from you know, well over 15, 20% in some communities, something in and around five to 10%. So when it's all said and done, when you look at that average annual number, it's really just a slowing in the growth of housing prices, more so on Low rise than on high rise. Me, I believe. Let me challenge you for a second and ask you a couple of questions yeah. if I could. Um, sure. So you talked about how a lot of that is in communities outside of the GTA. So people, and you know them and I know them, of 
not had to go to Bay and Bloor or Bay and uh, Front for uh, for a year and a half now. And so, you know, the how they're living in cottages in Blue Mountain and uh, and they're buying stuff in Alora and uh, and they're not commuting. But the once or twice they've commuted and it's been an hour or two hours uh, and then that's without traffic and then they got to do it with traffic. They start complaining for you to be right and prices not collapse in those communities and just go from double digit growth to single digit growth. Don't you have to believe that we're not going to go back to the office lifestyle, that we're going to stay remote? Um, no, and I'll tell you why. Um, earlier, I mentioned that house prices are a function of supply and demand. So what is that demand supply ratio? Uh, and what has it told us historically? Well, the demand supply ratio, uh, Brian, was in and around right now it is about 70% in the province of Ontario. What does that mean? It means that for every 10 new listings that flow onto the market, seven of those actually sell. That, that's 70% of those actually sell. Traditionally, that's considered a market that's on the cusp between a seller's and an overheated market. So even if your numerator in the sales to new listings ratio, that numerator could drop as much as 20%, and you're still not in a buyer's market which is a condition you need for prices to actually be falling. We've got such a buffer between the, the sales and listings, such a gap that you could, we can still accommodate a 20% drop in sales in suburban communities as that demand starts to flow back into the city and not see a dramatic uh, drop in price. Rather, what you're going to see is a, is, a, is, a, is a reset in the rate of change of prices from double digits to single digits. So get in, That's get what, in sorry, uh, you were cutting out, Brian, sorry. Get in now. Get, get, get in now. Buy now. Don't, for those people that are renting or those people that, you know, are thinking about buying, buy now because while you may not be 20% behind the market, you're going to be six or 7% behind the market. Get in now so you can at least get that single digit growth. So, okay, um, so, he, so I had some colleagues come up to me uh, six months, five months ago. They were in the market for a, ho for ho a home. Um, one lady was in the market for a condo. The other fellow was in the market for a single detached home. The lady who was in the market for a condo asked me point blank, Ted, what should I do? Six months ago, I said, if it's a condo, Go in now. The market has already turned. Investors have already come back in de December. Uh, sure enough, condo demand started moving up again because people were substituting out of expensive singles into condos. That's what, that's all they could afford early this year because we had this rapid price appreciation. So my uh, advice to her was go in now. My advice to the to uh, my colleague who wanted a single was. Um, just know that you will be engaging in bidding wars and you will be paying above market for that home. And we could see a reset, a very short reset uh, later this year, early 2022, but it won't last. But at least the market later this year in early 22 probably will be a little more balanced. You will have a bit more choice. And, you know, Brian, uh, as we speak, we're already starting to see signs that singles are not fetching as many offers. There's probably fetching five to seven offers versus 15 offers uh, in the first quarter. Uh, we're already seeing some signs of prices resetting for singles in some communities. Uh, so it depends the, you know, what type of housing you're, you're, you're after and when and how long you plan to stay in that housing. But I can tell you right now that with the economy, continuing to recover and grow with the market still quite tight. Uh, the best that we can hope for, if you're a prospective buyer, is that, you know, uh, those prices go from double digits to single digits, uh, a, 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 you know, based on some of the, the, the reasons I've, I've shared right now. Okay, what about uh, but, uh, mortgage yeah. rates? Mortgage rates. So, um, uh, you know, there's inflation in the system. Um, uh, we see signs of inflation. So you see it in the consumer price index on final goods. Uh, you're seeing inflation, Brian, in uh, commodities, uh, whether it's lumber. Uh, 100%. Uh, yeah. 
Absolutely. So you're seeing it in commodities, uh, oil, gas, uh, gold is moving up for, uh, I would say, legitimate reasons. People are sniffing that there's some inflation coming. Um, you're you're uh, the, out of the United States. They released their personal consumer expenditure price index, which is a very closely watched index that also beat expectations last week. So there's inflation in the system. The real question now is, is, is this temporary or is this, uh, is this going to persist? Uh, central bankers believe it's temporary. Don't worry about it. The bond market, however, which really matters for mortgage rates, has other thoughts. Uh, we've started to see bond yields trend up through most of 2021. That's the bond market saying, I don't believe you, central bankers. There is inflation in the system. Interest rates are headed up and they will persist. That inflation will persist. And so you did see uh, banks who borrow, uh, whose cost of funding did move up, uh, raise mortgage rates, fixed rate mortgages went up uh, in the first quarter. So I suspect we're going to see mortgage rates continue to move higher. And that should begin to dampen demand, particularly for more expensive housing like singles. Uh, I also believe that OSF, the OSFI rules are part of that picture um, in that uh, you know the benchmark rate uh, the OSFI benchmark rate was moved a bit higher. That came into effect um, explain today. That to every, explain to everyone, if you could, just for a second, what that OSFI benchmark rate is and what the, so, and what the rule uh, was. Okay. So in 2018, 2019, we began to stress test mortgages. And what that meant it was that if you uh, were a, a buyer who took out a mortgage uh, and the bank was offering you a contract rate of, for example, 2%, two, 2% um, you wouldn't be uh, qualified on 2%. We would uh, stress test that mortgage uh, at 2% plus an additional 2% uh, or the Bank of Canada benchmark rate and whatever was highest, right? So you would have to qualify uh, uh, at a higher rate um, back in 2018, 2019. What the current rule changes do is that th what they've done is, is they just move that benchmark rate up about 45 to 50 basis, about a half a percentage point. It's now sitting, it's gone from 4.79, it's now sitting at about five and a quarter percent. So uh, that benchmark rate uh, is really uh, what banks are stress testing against. So that's about a half a percentage point increase. Not a big deal in the grand scheme of things, but that along with just the general move up in, in interest rates and mortgage rates should begin to dampen demand uh, in the low rise space a little more. Uh, much more so than in the high rise space, obviously. Uh, so certainly, yeah, that, that's one thing that uh, that we're we're expecting uh, should happen, and it's really that along with FOMO bringing a lot of buying forward into the first quarter and creating this vacuum later in the year. You know, it's it's higher mortgage rates in that vacuum that's going to dampen the growth in sales, the growth in pricing. Those are really the two big, so big drivers. So if I've got to here. sell, sell now. If I've got to buy, wait to the fall. Um, you know, I'm. I'll be honest with you, Brian. Um, I I'm not in the business of sort of uh, telling people when what to buy you? and when to sell. Um, uh, one thing is clear to me that um, you know, if you were in the market for a single detached home, it really made sense to have uh, pulled the trigger, uh, uh, you know, two years ago, a year ago. Yeah. A year ago, a couple of years ago. Um, um, if you're in the market for, for a condo, uh, you know, there were some real opportunities in 2020, you know, the condo market, uh, you know, uh, lots of listings flowing on, on the marketplace. Uh, but, you know, I, I do think that we're going to see price growth in the low rise segment calm down uh, versus the, the, the high rise segment. In many ways, I think we could potentially see what we saw uh, between 2017 and 2019, and that is uh, condo prices growing very much in line with singles, if not even more. Uh, uh, rents 
you know, starting to grow again, largely because buyers are shifting, uh, not just away from uh, low rise to high rise, uh, but but uh, from from ownership into rental. So you're going to see that reset, uh, but it's not cataclysmic by any means here. We're chatting uh, tonight about the housing market. We're going to take a break and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us. What a fascinating conversation with Ted Siakopoulos, uh, the chief economist uh, with the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Um, he's uh, recently released a book uh, about, uh, uh, what's it called, Trendsetters? Uh, GTA Trendsetters. GTA Trendsetters, and it's uh, some recommendations for Gen Z people on uh, what they need to be doing uh, and what they need to be thinking about. And I'm going to ask you about that in a second. And we've had a pretty frank conversation in regards to um, housing uh, prices and uh, and while you say you don't like giving people advice on on what to do and what not to do, my assessment of what you say don't correct me, but my assessment of what you say is that you do think it's a bubble, uh, but uh, it's not going to burst because we got nothing that's going to burst it. Uh, but what you think is that uh, the bubble might just uh, just not grow anymore for uh, for a couple of quarters and uh, and calm down. It's not going to keep expanding uh, the way it has for the last. Uh, last couple of years. You call it the, the reset. Some people call it the great reset. We'll, we'll see whether it's just a reset or a great reset. Uh, Ted, let's wrap it all together if we could. If uh, you know, you were advising a Gen Z person that uh, was thinking about getting a job in downtown Toronto um, and trying to figure out what to do. Um, and you've outlined a bunch of different trends in regards to jobs, real estate, uh, et cetera, demographics debt, um, other than putting together a budget, which is one of the things that really I grew, I took from your, uh, your conversation more than anything else is get a budget because that uh, then you can live within it. And uh, people that don't have a budget don't live within it. Uh, other than that, what are your recommendations to a Gen Z person? Well, you know, Brian, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to stick to to where it all where it all begins and uh you know the COVID 19 uh, pandemic sent a very blunt message um that uncertainty is is the norm and not the exception uh moving forward and we need we, we really need to plan for the unexpected um you know planning for the unexpected uh is tough because it requires discipline uh it requires some foresight um uh, but just because it's difficult doesn't mean we should stop trying, right? Um, we need to get into really good financial habits um, uh, early in life because that really increases the likelihood that we're going to be able to manage risks that prop up later in life. Uh, and having, uh, as I say, having a plan or a budget is critical because, you um, you know, with a budget really comes the ability to save, to invest, uh, to rent or, or buy a home. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the research is clear that if we plan properly, uh, we're able to manage risks properly um, and we engage in less impulsive buying. Uh, and, and that's critical because that allows us to think more, um, you know, more with our minds and less with our hearts. Um, with respect to Gen Z, I would say uh, that if you don't have a plan, uh, build a plan, um, um, ensure that your skills will remain resilient in the face of digital change, uh, because it's not just a matter of how do I manage the income once I start earning that income, uh, and as I say, a budget is your, your tool. It's also about how do I maximize purchasing power? And, and that uh, gets back to how do I remain resilient in the face of technological change? Do I have the skills? What do I need to get skills that will help build purchasing power and put me in a position where I can buy and rent a home? Um, so I, I think that's critical. The other critical piece, Brian, is we talked a lot about aging demographics and uh, not in my backyard, NIMBYism. And I think um, we need to change the conversation. I think um, uh, younger households are a growing demographic uh, as well. Uh, they need to exercise their political will 
Uh, we need to to uh, go get out and vote for sure. Um, we, we, we need to we need to uh, set the next generation up for success. So it does mean that we need collaboration between builders, uh, prospective buyers and the community at large, and even city the city council, right? Uh, who ultimately makes a decision on what, uh, what type and where things get built. So, so we need that collaboration um, in order to set this next generation up for success. Ted Siakopoulos, you've been uh, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your advice. I've got one last question for you. Is debt a four letter word? Um, not always. There's good debt and there's bad debt. I would consider um, mortgage debt as good debt because it is secured by uh, an asset that, you know, over four decades has done a great job appreciating, right? Uh, I would consider credit card debt as bad debt. You want to get out of that. It's high interest debt. It, it, there's no asset securing it. It just boosts your debt to asset ratio. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, keep your debt to asset ratio uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a comfortable range. I would even consider student loan debt as good debt because you're taking on debt to boost financial and purchasing power in the future. You're educating yourself. You're investing in the future. Car debt? Yeah. Car debt is not good debt in my books. Um, depreciating asset debt sometimes can be even greater than the depreciating asset. It, that's for sure. But, you know, car debt, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're taking on debt uh, on, a, on an asset that's depreciating. Uh, my wife and I always have this debate. Do we buy or do we lease? Uh, we've, we seem to uh, <laughs> lease more often than buy. Ted Siakopoulos, uh, uh, thank you uh, again so much. If people want to get your book, how do they get it? So uh, the best way is to really just Google the, the title of the book, GTA Trendsetters. It is available through Amazon. Uh, pro, all proceeds go to charity, help women who face domestic violence. So it's a, it's a great, uh, great cause, great charity. That's our show for tonight, everybody. Ted Siakopoulos, the president, sorry, not the president, the chief economist of the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Uh, he's here on his, with his own views, not uh, his organization's views. But uh, his organization must really benefit from uh, the intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom that this gentleman has brought to our show tonight. Ted, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for having me.